Today on Super Soul Sunday, New York Times bestselling author William Paul Young takes us on his heartbreaking yet redemptive spiritual journey that culminated in the book The Shack. His blockbuster novel that has sold more than 20 million copies in this year became one of the most successful faith-based motion pictures of all time. And later, I'll ask Paul about his provocative new book, Lies We Believe About God. All your friends are gonna be calling you. <laughs> Who would have thought that you're on a train writing a Christmas book? Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know that to start. I started researching about, because I obviously read The Shack along when everybody else read it. And uh, I, I didn't know the story of how it came to be. So yeah. I love the idea that something that started out to be a gift has been a gift for over 20 million people throughout the world. I love the idea that 15 copies at Office Depot did everything I ever wanted it to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, it's God's great sense of humor. It is. It is. God is, la God is doing an LOL on, over this one. Absolutely. Absolutely. It surprised everybody. The Shack is the story of Mackenzie, Mac Phillips, a man questioning his faith after his six-year-old daughter, Missy, is kidnapped and murdered on a family vacation. After three years of mourning, Mac gets a letter from God requesting a meeting at The Shack, the place of Missy's murder. So you were doing it as a gift because? Because I've always written, but you know, like anybody does, you write poetry and songs and short stories and you give them to your friends and family and they think it's incredible. Oh, this is beautiful. I know, because yeah, yeah. they're your friends and family. Yeah. And uh, Kim, who I've been married to now almost 37 years, she, uh, she'd been saying, you know, someday as a gift for our kids, and we have six children, mm -hmm. our youngest was 13 at the time, she said, someday as a gift for our children, would you just write something that puts in one place how you think, because you think outside the box? And I didn't feel healthy enough as a human being to, to take that on until the year I turned 50. Yeah. I'm working so three So what year jobs. was this when, you were, when she said this to you? This, well, she'd been saying it up until uh, 2005 is the year right. that on the, on the commuter train to one of my three jobs. That yes. I felt like I've got 40 minutes each way and nothing to give the kids for Christmas. What and were so, your three jobs at the time? I was doing shipping and receiving, um, did all the janitorial, so cleaned all the toilets and swept the floors. And I did uh, uh, doing some hotel night clerking. And then on the side, I did web conferencing for some companies around the world. And how did you feel about yourself in that space with in, those three jobs? Ah, terrific. I, I had gotten finally, and this is why I could write a story like this. I'd finally gotten in comfortable inside my own skin. And it had taken me, you know, it'd take me 50 years because of, I grew up moderate evangelical fundamentalist. I grew up missionary kid, preacher's kid, and uh, with a lot of great sadness. And it took a long time to work it out. Paul says his great sadness stems from a traumatic childhood that included years of sexual abuse. As an adult, Paul says he developed an addiction to pornography, and later, after 15 years of marriage, he experienced a broken open moment when he had a destructive affair with his wife's best friend. And you get the call, you get the call. One sentence. Uh, uh, one sentence, and I've done hundreds, maybe even thousands of shows over the years with men who've had affairs, women who've had affairs, and the way the person finds out is always you know, always fuels the wrath. Yeah. So you got the one sentence from Kim yeah, yeah. that said, I'm in your office. I, I didn't confess. I got caught. Yeah. And a lot of us were so broken that, you know, exposure is the only gift that opens up a pathway to healing. Uh -huh. And it doesn't feel like a gift. Yeah, exposure certainly is a not tough at the time. Thing. No. Yeah. And uh, the one sentence phone call was, I'm waiting for you at your office and I know. Did you know what she knew? Yeah, instantly. Whoa. What was so bad about it is that I'd spent all my life, yeah, 38 years old at the time, but I'd spent my life trying to build a facade, hoping that I could win affection and approval. And I, when you've got that kind of hole or hiddenness in your heart, mm -hmm. and, and you think the delusion of being loved unconditionally shows up, yeah. you're a sucker yeah. for that. And, um, and so, you know, you begin to twist reality in order to try to justify yourself. Yeah. 
And I had done that. And then it was the choice at that point was either kill myself or face her. Yeah. And do you actually thought about killing oh, yourself? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So suicide has been a, f a companion most of my life because of some of the, the damage. Horrible things. Yeah. Yeah. To you. yeah. So okay. you're driving across town and you're thinking. Uh, you know what? I don't even remember from, it was like 2.30 in the afternoon on January 4th, 1994. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are those moments yes. that, that forever are embedded in your history because yeah. then they become part of the ground that you finally land on, you can stand on. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember the drive from one side of town to the other because really the choice, because I was done running. I'd spent my whole life running away from dealing with my stuff in one way or the other. And, um, and now I'm gonna walk in and face- The wrath. The wrath. The wrath. Yep. And Kim's, you know, originally from North Dakota. And if you know anything about Midwest folk, there's no 50 shades of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know? cool. it's like All either right. this or that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and she lit into me. And you know, partly what saved my life was the intensity of her fury. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it took us really to heal. It took 11, 11 years. But what's interesting yeah. about what I've read about the story is that um, you did the thing that so many people caught in that situation, caught, don't do. Yeah. You not only confessed, but you said, I'm going to tell you everything. And yeah. you spent the next four days. Yeah. So after about the first four hours of, of her fury, I said to her, if we're going to do this, I need to tell you every secret I have because secrets have been killing me my whole life. Yeah. And naively, she said, bring it on. And over the course of four days, I told her, and she wanted to know every detail about everything, and I told her, yeah. and it destroyed her. I mean, at the end of four days, she said, I will never believe another word that comes out of your mouth the rest of your life. Wow. And, and I really had hit the bottom. You know, there's a lot of times people think they've Well, how the does bottom. that feel when you have now poured out your soul, you've said everything you know to be true for yourself, and then the person says, fine, whatever, That's I exactly don't believe right. it. Yeah. I'm never going to believe you again. And, and I thought that's the way it was going to be. And for a long time, it was just like that. And it was like, all right, so why, what am I going to do now? I don't ever want to be in a situation where I hurt people like this again. Yeah. You know, so, so I, I went over to the Yellow Pages. Remember the Yellow Pages? I remember the Yellow Pages. <laughs> and I opened it up under counselors, and I started with the A's, and I walked my way down from the, from the A's, and I got to Agape Youth and Family Services, specializing in sexual abuse histories, because that's Ooh. part of my great sadness. And, um, and I call up total strangers. And agape is the word, you know, God is love. Yes, yes. And, and I needed some unconditional love. I needed, but I needed to know, is there a way out of this? Can I change? So I didn't, Kim didn't ask me to do that. And um, it's like for the it first- It was either that or die. It is. Either it that is. or die. Because I, you know. And I want to yeah. just say here, I, and I, I want to just articulate and clarify, because I know people are listening. And, it, you know, I've done so many shows where people say, oh, you're blaming your past for what you did. I mean, the fact that you were abused as a young boy is no excuse for what you not did to your wife. All. And you're not saying that. Not you're just saying all. it's all a part of yeah. the big hole yeah. in your soul. And when, when you hit the bottom, you no longer are pointing fingers. You're owning what you've done. Yeah. And you're also trying to find a way to let go of control. But at the bottom, were you one of those at the bottoms going, why me? No. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, you understood no. why. Yeah. Yeah, you and took responsibility. That's yes. what real taking responsibility for. Yeah, ownership. Ownership. Yeah. yeah, the beauty of that is, is that that comes from the inside out. Right. Responsibility comes from the outside in and judges you based on your performance. So we, we're designed to live with an ability to respond. That's what children naturally have. Yeah. And taking ownership of it. That's. That's what it is. Taking own it. I yeah. fully own this. I it. Meaning I'm not blaming anybody no. else. And I've got to look at my history, but I did this and I want to know why. And that was my, that was my question to my therapist. Mm -hmm. but he says, I said to him the first day, for the first time in my life, I said to another human being, can you help me? Wow. And this wasn't to save my marriage. I've blown that up to smithereens. Yeah. This wasn't to- Because she already to, said, I'm not gonna believe another yep, word you said. Yep. Yeah. And this wasn't to fix Kim. 
right? I, at this point, I really know that I can't heal myself. Why would I have the audacity to think I could heal anybody else? Yeah. So this is about, I've got to find a way to change or else there is really no point here. Well, you know what the beauty of all of this is, is that our, our shame, our challenges, our struggles, our holes, is what eventually, if we're willing to see them clearly and do the work, is what makes us whole. And yeah. out of that came this. It did. That had you not been broken, yeah. you could have never written McKinsey. That's true. You know, and people say sometimes, if, if you knew what everything, about the shack and what it would do and all that, would you go back and change anything? I say, absolutely. If, if it cost the shack and all of this, if I could go back and not hurt the people that I did, I'd change it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The process of transformation is not about becoming something that we weren't. It's about unveiling what we were the whole time. The movement toward wholeness is when the way of our being matches the truth of our being. Woo, I love that. You're the almighty God, right? You know everything. And you're everywhere all at once. And you have limitless power. Yet somehow, let my little girl die when she needed you most. You abandoned her. I never left her. If you are who you say you are, where were you when I needed you? When all you see is your pain, you lose sight of me. So you wrote the shack originally for your children and your friends. Yeah. Mackenzie is obviously you. And Missy. And Missy. Is yeah. me. And, and Missy is you. Yeah. So you wrote it for them, about you, but also for you. Yes. And you know, part of the beauty of it is that um, it wasn't written as part of the therapeutic process. It wasn't, you know, that thing. It was out of coming to a place where I finally was comfortable inside my own skin. And we had nothing. I'm working with three jobs. And, but I'm totally content thinking, like, the rest of my life is going to be like this. And I, and I write a story for my kids for Christmas. Make the 15 copies. Go back to work. And my friends start giving it away. Wow. <laughs> I know. So crazy. How did you see God as a black woman? I think that's pretty darn cool. I think it's really cool. And, uh, and, and you always remember, I wrote this for my kids, didn't think the world was gonna read it. Yeah. I wouldn't have changed that at yeah. all. And I grew up in a brown culture. In fact, I was like six before I consciously came to awareness that I was white, which was a huge disappointment. <laughs> 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 I was at, sent to boarding school, you know, and uh, uh, missionary boarding school. Because before this, because at one, you had moved to New Guinea, yeah. right? So I was a year old. When so you were brought there. up around brown people. Yeah. Yeah, they're my world. And, and this is missions back in the day when the parents did the work of God and, and basically trusted God to take care of the kids. So yeah. I, didn't, I didn't grow up connected to my parents and then got sent away to boarding school. Yeah. And, and sadly... Uh, you were abused old, there, you were abused before yeah. you even... I, uh, in the tribal school. culture and then yeah. to boarding school where I was the youngest, right? Six years old. Mm -hmm. And at, at night, the big boys would... Even the, the first night. Yeah. Yeah. The bo big boys come in. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I don't think there's anything that is equivalent of sexual abuse that tears apart the fabric of a human soul. I just think that it just, if there's anything that is going to absolutely empower the lies of shame into the, into the deepest places of our being, that's, that'll do it. I'm so happy to hear you speak about it because in all the years and all the hundreds of shows that I did talking about it to victims, to people who were perpetrators, to people who survived. I could never in all those years get across that. It, people think it's the act. 
And what used to always offend me is you're in a conversation and people want to know, well, was there penetration or was there not penetration? And they don't understand that when you're four and five and six and ten yep. and you don't even have a language to explain what it is, it yep. doesn't even matter. Yep. It's the shame that you carry because yep. of it. Yeah. And I mean, it took me years to get I remember when our oldest, uh, he turned six and I'm watching him and suddenly this thought goes through my head. How could it have been his fault? And he, and he wasn't abused, Yeah. right? But I'm all of a sudden him. You see yourself I as saw, that six-year-old little boy. Because he's our oldest, first yeah. time we've had a six-year-old. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I don't remember being that six-year-old. This little boy who's right in front of me, who loves life, who is free, who is good. My remembrance of six is not like that at mm -hmm. all. Of course not. Yeah. yeah. And that's why when people talk, talk to me about the transitions in my life, I said, I, it took me 50 years to become a child. Yeah. Well, it happened to me first when I was nine. So I feel the same thing when I see nine-year-old little girls. It does, Come it on. triggers that whole, that whole yeah. thing. There's a shack inside of all of us. Yeah. And it is our own heart. It is our own soul. Uh, you know, I... I think the process of transformation is not about becoming something that we weren't. It's about unveiling what we were the whole time. I think that we are made in the image of God. We were very good creations before anything got broken, but it all got covered up by all this crap. That's a moment to remember. So there's nothing to transform. There's just all of this to uncover. Everything has been unveil. about covering. Yeah. Yep. It's about right uncovering. from the beginning. When, when in the and Genesis, the process of the uncovering yeah. becomes your own transformation. Absolutely. You are transformed yep. by but, the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your spirit. But it will challenge all the lies. Yeah. Because the lies are, shame tells me I am something wrong. Guilt tells me I've done something wrong. That's legit. But shame tells me I am something wrong. And if that lie exists at the core of my being, everything else becomes cover-up. Religion becomes cover-up, power, performance, it all is covering up. Yeah. You, know, you, you know that you can wear makeup as an expression to exhibit the beauty of the person who is there or, or to, cover to cover up, up. Yes. right? Yeah. Same kind of concept. Yeah. 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 Shame says, I am this. Guilt says, I did this. Right. Yes, and what's interesting about that is the, the wounds that so many of us carry and have carried is because of the shame. Yeah, is shame is the huge driver in our lives. So the shack is the house on the inside that people helped us build. And a lot of us, we didn't get good help. People with the best of intentions brought all their baggage and dumped it on us. You know, and, and so it becomes the place where we then hide all our addictions and store all of our secrets. And, and, it, and we're so ashamed of that place that we never want another human being to come in there because we're terrified that when we look in their face, we're gonna see the same look of disgust that we see in the mirror. Mm. And yet, we're fighting for some glimmer of light, you know, kindness and grace and, and acceptance and affirmation. And yet when we're offered it, we don't believe them because they don't know the secrets, Yeah. right? Right. So we create the facade outside. We then perform as fast as we can pick up people's expectations. Yeah. And, and we live yeah. with this facade. Most yeah. people are living the facade. Yeah. I love it in the shack when God said, pain has a way of clipping our wings and keeping us from being able to fly. She waited a moment, allowing her words to settle. And if it's unresolved for very long, you can almost forget that you were ever created to fly in the first place. That is so true. Yeah. Pain has a way of doing that. And then it becomes, it becomes the place that we then name a sanctuary. Uh, a lot of people can't let go of their hurt and they can't move forward. And then everything gets defined by that. Mm. And um, part of the journey is to allow God with skin on, community, to climb inside that space with us and tell us the truth. God with skin on. Yeah. yeah. That's, we're designed for relationship, you know? We're designed for community. And we can't do this alone. We just can't. Coming up. I allowed myself to fall into trust. And that's when we learned that the opposite of more is enough. Oh.
You know, one of the things I love that you say is that, you know, the opposite uh, of of more is enough. Of more is enough. <laughs> and we live in this world where we're just all looking for more and more and more and more, and we're looking for more things to fill us up and more things to make us whole. But the opposite of more is enough. Yes. When is enough enough? Yeah, well, that's the good question, isn't it? Yeah, that as is. As soon as you ask it, you're already thinking more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that really came to fruition in dealing with the loss of everything financial and all yes. that. I mark my 11 years from January 4th, 94 to the end of 2004. 2005, I write the story for my kids for Christmas 2005. And uh, those 11 years are represented by McKenzie's Weekend in the Shack. And uh, when we lost everything, it, it was dealing you with... You lost everything because of what? Business oh, investments? Yeah, of... yeah. And stupidity back in the day, you know, when I didn't tell Kim stuff because I didn't want to bother her with it. You know, the yeah. way that men BS their ability to lie or s try to self-justify. And a whole bunch of things. But at that point, there's no secrets, right? I'm, everything's out there. But I know, we're, I know we're heading for a little bit of a a huge crash actually in 2004. And it was dealing with a major fear. I can trace my journey on the issue of trust because that was so violated as a child that I had no inclination, let alone capacity to trust anybody. Mm -hmm. And so this is why religion became attractive because you don't actually have to trust God as long as you know what he wants you to do, Right. right? So it's not about trust. And so just give me the rules and the list of rules or whatever your expectations are, and I'll try to perform up to them, or at least hide the fact that I'm not performing well. But trust? And over the course of these 11 years of dismantling pretty much everything that I believed about myself and about God, and the reconstruction, the issue of trust emerges. And this was the 11th year going like, I'm going like, how come I've trusted you my whole life? This is my prayer conversation with God, which, it took me five days to realize how self-deluded I was. You know, for me to start any conversation, yeah. how come I've trusted you my whole life about anything? It's like, how self-deluded are we? Yeah. That's when I called up the guys in my life and I said, that's about a dozen of them now, which is a miracle by itself because shame always isolates, right? So you were certainly afraid to trust, trust men. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And now, by, through these 11 years, I have all these men in my life that are that have really brought healing to, to my soul, right? Help, help rebuild the house on the inside. So I call them up and I say, look, I know you love us. Here's our financial situation. I know you love my family. You guys, you like to fix things. Please, please don't rescue me from this. Don't rescue me from this? Yeah, don't. Because when you run into these issues where fear has such a dominant place, you're either gonna go to control or you're gonna go to trust, Yeah. right? And my whole thing, my whole life has been about control, right, because I couldn't trust. So when I run into these things, it's like, how do I let go of control here? And for, for in this situation, it was, please don't rescue me from this because you're probably gonna be interfering with what God is doing in my heart. Mm. And that fall, Seven of those guys, unbeknownst to me, took time off from work and sat with me at the county courthouse in Oregon City and held my hand while they auctioned off the house we'd lived in for 17 years. Oh. And they took the house, they took the cars, and we ended up moving first to a, a little rental in the middle of 500 acres of Christmas trees and then a couple months later into Gresham, 900 square feet on the corner of 12th little rental house. But I could- You and how many, you and all your four, kids? Four of the kids four were kids. still home. Two were on scholarship in university. So you let yourself fall? Yeah. You allowed yourself to fall. You allowed yourself I to- I allowed myself to fall into trust. And that's when we learned that the opposite of more is enough, oh. right? And we suddenly, I mean, some months we had- So those friends yeah. could have, I mean, most people would be- Two of them, three of them could have written a check and knocked us out of our situation. I was gonna say, I mean, geez. I know, I know. But there comes a Most point in Most people yeah. would have said, could you loan me the money? Could you give me the, the I, I promise know. this won't happen again if I you only know. would help me. And that is so profound because I always think, you know, I'm the, I'm the person who a lot of people come to, can you help me out if you would only do this? And what I have learned is money never 
saves people. You're absolutely right. It only delays whatever was already waiting for yep. them because they have yep. created the situation based upon the way they've handled or managed their life. Yep. And I, just as you said, that's why it's such a big aha revelation that you knew it before, but yeah. I have blocked people from receiving whatever blessings they really needed to receive, yeah. whatever lessons they needed to learn by writing the check. Right, because they think that money will give them the control that will conquer their fear. Oh my God, that is so, that is miraculously profound for me. And it was profound for us. You know, suddenly joy dropped on us like a ton of bricks and we had nothing. Wow. Right? Because after that is when you wrote. That's when I wrote that's this That's when you story. wrote this. Because I had nothing to give them for Christmas. What do you think Jesus would think about all that's made of him and the religions and wars that are fought over him? Mm. William Paul Young says his new book, Lies We Believe About God, is a conversational exploration into the misguided thinking he believes many of us have and share about God. The biggest lie we tell ourselves about God yes, about is that God, God is, is not, not good, good all the time. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and that God relates to us in a way that uh, is arbitrary and distant. He's the omni-being. He's the darkness behind Jesus that Jesus came to save us from. That's what a lot of us grew up believing. And the truth is, as you believe it, that Jesus is the expression not only of the character and nature of God, but what it's like to be fully human and fully alive. Yeah, so he is the truth of our being. Yeah. That Jesus came to say, this is how you do it. Exactly. This not is to, how yeah. you do it. And not to start a new religion. Yeah. 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 What do you think Jesus would think about all that's made of him and the religions and wars that are fought over him? Well, obviously he's grieved because we are. Yes. Where do we think he dwells? You know, he dwells within our own hearts. And our grief for the things that are wrong doesn't originate in us. It is something that we share. Yeah, you know, and, but I don't, God's not surprised. Here, here's the deal, Oprah. I think that, and, and another lie, I think God has a high view of humanity, not a low one. I think the lie is that all we are is a piece of crap. And it's just because God is merciful sometimes. Well, that's a lie sometimes. some religions tell people, that yeah. you are born of sin, you are sin. You're, you're depraved, you're yes, worthless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and the world tells you that. It's based on your production, you know, and all yes. the I am nots, right? Yes. I'm not this, I'm not smart enough, not thin enough, I'm not a boy, I'm not whatever, whatever, whatever the lie is. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. go through the lies and you just give me one or two sentences. Okay. Okay, God loves us but doesn't like us. Yeah, that's a lie because God knows the truth about who we are. God also knows the ways that we're covered up. So, you know, when you know the truth of someone, you've, you've run into this, relationship breaks the rules, right? Yeah. And the divisions. Yeah. This is a God who knows you. He loves. Because you have come out of that creation. Wow, well, yeah, you're okay. made in God's image. Okay, God is in control. Now that's a big one because we want we think of God as deterministic and fatalistic. That is, so when bad things happen, and that came out of a conversation with a friend whose best friend had been in a stunt in Germany and had a massive thing go wrong and ended up a quadriplegic. And people were, Christian, my people, were saying, you know, well, God is in control and look at this must be part of the plan of God. So we think of God as this architect. Yeah rather than a God who climbs into and submits to the darkness we bring to the table in order to build something with us out of it. That's you a high view of humanity. You say, I don't believe that, uh, this is on page 42, but don't believe that the word control in the sense of deterministic power is part of God's vocabulary. We invented the idea as part of our need to dominate and maintain the myth of certainty. Yep, Ah, control. Control. See, relationship always introduces us to mystery. Yes. And we lose control. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And ask any married man. They'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and what I love about this is that this is about relationship. It's never been about deterministic power. And people think that that's an affront to God. As soon as God creates a being that can say no, 
there's no control or else love is forced. And if love is forced, it's no love at all. That's right. And so free will is the order. <laughs> free will. It's a high view of humanity. High yep. view of humanity. I love what you say on the back of the book and also in the introduction that this lies we believe about God is not a presentation of certainty, you write. Rather, it's a taste of larger conversations, yeah. which is why I love this platform of Super Soul Sunday. Because you say, you may identify with some of the topics, not with others. You might agree or disagree with my conclusions. Some of these ideas may be deeply challenging which I'm sure you've heard. I've heard a little. <laughs> While others may <laughs> seem naive and thoughtless, that is the wonder and uniqueness of our journeys and the beauty of dialogue and relationship. Come on. So this is just, a, this is about opening up the questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I've never written. When I wrote The Shack and, and you can see it in the movie and all that, I never wrote. In Crossroads and yeah, Eve. Crossroads yeah, Crossroads and Eve. It's never been with an agenda to try to get you from over here to over there. Right. It's to explore this space, open up the questions so that you can hear for yourself. Okay, I'm going down the line. Okay. God does not submit. God is a Christian. I think every religion thinks God is whatever they are. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. <laughs> God has never been a religious being. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, help us right now. <laughs> For, Think about it. All, all, your, all your friends are going to be, be calling you. God has never been a religious being. And that means that there was never a time before creation where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are going like, so who's in charge of service this weekend? Where are we meeting? You know, are you doing communion? Or, mm -hmm. you know? So that tells us that everything that is religious on the planet is something that human beings have brought to the table. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the wonder of a God who submits, the chapter before is that God climbs into what we brought to the table because God has a high respect for the creation, a much higher respect than we do, and climbs into it in order to dismantle everything that is darkness that is in it. The movement toward wholeness is when the way of our being matches the truth of our being. Ooh, I love that. What do you see as the clear path to take to most access the heart of God? Ooh. Unfortunately for a lot of us, the clearest path becomes exposure. We have to be exposed. The lies have to be exposed. We have to figure out what we've learned to agree with, where we have begun to identify our prisons as sanctuaries, right? And where we've created an identity, worth, value system, all based on performance. Wholeness, the movement toward wholeness, is when the way of our being matches the truth of our being. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. So the question is, what's the, the way of our being matches, matches the, the truth, truth of, of our, our being. being? So what's the truth of our being? That's my next question. Okay. And I think that's that is everything that is true about God, because we're made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So this is why nobody in the New Testament prays for patience. And we've got such a skewed view of God that we'll tell each other, well, don't pray for patience because that omni being the darkness behind Jesus, he's going to get you and force you to be patient, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason that they don't is because they know the truth of their being. Fruit of the Spirit is patience. God is patient by nature mm -hmm. and you're made in the image of God. Now, a lot of us, we've got to the place where we like being impatient. You know, and we've, begun, we've lied to ourselves about it for so long that we think that that's the truth of our being. And then religion says, well, you're supposed to be patient. So now we're in conflict, but we're think, we think we're impatient. You know, the thing that I've come to understand is the oneness of God, the connectedness through all of us, how yeah. I see it in all of us. How do we get people to see that? There's nothing outside of God. Yeah. We have this imagination where creation is blown out like some kind of a bubble, right? And then disconnected from God. And now it messed itself up. So God sends Jesus over there to build a bridge back. That's not the truth. Creation is created right in the center of this other centered self-giving community of, of love. And we're designed that way. That's the truth of our being. And if we can begin to agree with it, the way of our being will change to naturally match it. Otherwise, it's just covering up the fact that we believe we're just pieces of crap. Why are we in this state in our divided country right now? Oh, because 
This is a fantastic opportunity in transition time and our politics has exposed, not created, has exposed the uncivility that exists in the hearts of human beings, right? This is a time of exposure. When I said that the movement of our lives is always through exposure of one sort or another, the lies or, you know, the shame. Peeling back. Peeling letting back. Letting the truth come through. Right. Yeah, letting so, the truth come true. So all of a sudden we have a political situation, not just here, but around the world, where the uncivility or the brokenness of the human heart is being exposed. Well, we can either run back to some form of control. Yeah. Or we can engage or in a try to hide it. Yep. Or, Keep pretending. Yep. yep. Yeah. Or we can begin to cross the dividing walls and begin to relate to one another as face to face and human eyeball to eyeball. And those those walls are coming down. And and so this is here to show us what down. this is here. These times are here to show us what one is that how broken we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On That's the one would, hand, absolutely. And and two that there is a larger conversation that we need to engage in where relationship is at the center of our humanity. It's not an option, right? And that's gonna attack every point of prejudice that we have, any of these divisions. It's going to challenge our institutional structures and systems that have largely been a way to control, right? Based on our fears. When our fears get exposed, there's a possibility of healing. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up. What is the lesson that's taking you the longest to learn? Mm. Great question. What's the biggest obstacle you see to peace right now? Mm. Mm -hmm. The lie. The lie that says that I'm better than you. Mm. Right? Yeah. The lie that builds its identity on nationalism versus humanity. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, we have to allow the wonder of our commonness to arise that is absolutely not contingent upon color and economics, pride. Um, Ego. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where we learn to celebrate our differences. What is the lesson that's taken you the longest to learn? Mm. Great question. Um, it took me a long time to become a child. It took me a answer. long time to live inside the grace of one day. I just love that phrase. Oh my gosh. You know what? I don't know how there's any way to navigate life except that reality that we live in, we're only given grace for one day. And as controllers, we even create imaginations that don't exist in order to freak ourselves out so that we try to control the universe and everything around us. Control is a total myth. You know, some cell in my brain can go sideways tonight and it's all she wrote, right? And sufficient to the day is the grace thereof. You get grace for one day. And, um, and for me, partly the, the, the trauma of having to face all my crap reduced my world down to sometimes not even one day. It was like one minute. You know, you just put one foot in front of the other. But it's never gotten more than one day. And it's like, no, I got enough grace for one day. Tomorrow has enough issues of its own. I'll deal with it tomorrow. So part of learning how to participate with this journey is to take every empty imagination captive that raises itself up against the knowing of God. Mm. God loves you to the degree there is fear in your life, to that degree you don't know yet how much you're loved, there is no fear in love. The one who fears is not perfected in love. Perfect love casts out fear. How do we learn to express empathy towards people whose views are very different from our own? You were talking about mm. this idea of relationship. You take the risk of relationship. See, again, we can get inside of our heads and create an imagination of those people, whoever those people are. It's like, you know, the people who are in a little bit of conflict about the shack and Eve and Crossroads and this book, they're my people. Those yeah. are my people. My I heard that, that there were people protesting you recently 
and <laughs> it was hot outside. And so I took up bottles of water. Yeah. Yeah. And then and, they said, who are you? Yeah. And I said, I'm the guy that wrote the book that you're mad about. What? So they all gathered around and 15 minutes later come to find out not one of them had actually read it. They're all out protesting yeah. you. Yeah. Those are my people. <laughs> We're addicted to being right. <laughs> and uh, so, but be careful how you talk about them because they are absolutely precious to me. And, um, but yeah, how do, you take the risk of relationship and this is happening anyway. The walls are coming down and we just want to create more dividing walls to try to keep ourselves safe. What do you want people most to know about the lies that we tell ourselves about God? Mm. Well, I want them to know that those are lies. Um, and this is just 28 of them oh, that you came up with. We had like 150 yeah. going in, you know? Yeah. And uh, everybody is on such a unique journey to uncover the truth about who they are. I want people to have an encounter inside their own story because that's where the holy ground is. Mm. I uh, think that, oh, yeah. I feel, I know that is true. Yeah. An encounter inside your own story. Yeah. Because that is where the holy ground is. That's where you see the burning bush. Mm -hmm. That's where God only is burning away the things that aren't true. And those lies are not true. And I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it shakes you up. I tell people, I think this is why we're born barefoot. Right? We're always been intended to walk on holy ground. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I, I enjoy nothing. Well, you can see I got a lot of lawn here, so I, I enjoy do. nothing more than walking barefoot in the grass. Come on. Thank you for sharing yourself with me today. Oh, ah, darling. I so appreciate uh, what you do. Uh, thank you. Oh, my thank goodness. You.